So, who is David Hayter? <laughs> oh, well, I'm... Accomplished actor, screenwriter, voice of a generation. <laughs> well, I... Citizen of the world. Uh, yeah, well, I never... Ripped from the comfortable childhood in Canada, thrown into the turbulent waters of adolescence in Kobe, Japan. How did you stay afloat? You mean, you mean in high school? Uh, well, my dad got uh, transferred overseas, and um, it was a really excellent experience, actually. I, I was really grateful for it. Grateful. What is your biggest secret, David? Pardon me? You can tell us. Oh, well, it's not much of a secret, but I, um, uh, I have a tattoo of Kobe behind my ear. Tattoo? Splendid! Yeah, it's... I mean, it's not terribly big. What are you wearing? I, what do you mean? Why are you here? Oh, well, I was hoping to promote my new movie. I'm just coming off of the set. No, David Hayter. Why here, wearing an eye patch? Oh, the eye patch. Uh, this is pretty cool, actually. Mm. Gives me uh, real-time information and, and uh, you know, weather, traffic reports. Um, Actually, watching a baseball game as we, uh, as we speak. Oh, Billy. What drives you? What are your dreams? <sighs> well, you know, I'd have to say my dream project. Let your dreams drive you. Oh, a message of hope to today's young people from David Hayter. Mm. I never actually said that. Do you like what you see outside your window? Will you ever respect the face in your mirror? Will your children thank you for the sacrifices you're about to make? Our mission is to hear you say yes. Perfecting the world through conquest of technology. Protecting civilian contingent through strategic combat solutions. Werewolf. Evolution. Reinvented. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is the fourth in a series of four reviews that I'm doing on Metal Gear Solid. If you've never watched these videos before, then I highly recommend starting with the other videos first, as this one picks up where those left off. Please be aware this video will contain full story spoilers for Metal Gear Solid 1 through 4. Metal Gear Solid 4 was released in 2008 for the PlayStation 3. The focus this time returns to Solid Snake, who hadn't been the primary protagonist of the series since Metal Gear Solid 1, ten years earlier. This time around, Snake is on a mission to finally take out Liquid and stop the wars that have engulfed the entire globe. The game opens during a combat scene in the Middle East where Snake talks about how the nature of war has changed. It's a less flashy entrance than the previous two games, but the speech itself does some good world building, explaining how much has changed between the events of MGS 2 and 4. The opening few minutes are a bit frustrating in how frequently they wrestle control away from the player, but one thing they showcase brilliantly are these seamless transitions between cutscene and gameplay. The Gecko are introduced immediately and although they obviously lack the ability to fire nukes, they have the high mobility of a Metal Gear since they walk on legs. There's something vaguely disturbing about their muscle-like legs and mooing noises but most of all they're intimidating, so much so that Snake has no choice but to flee from them. This immediate encounter with the Gecko helps to reinforce the stealth theme and also shows just how far technology has come, something which is touched on a lot as the game goes on. One good example of this is the Octo Camo suit which Snake now wears as camouflage. Rather than returning to the style of stealth present in MGS 1 and 2, MGS 4 feels far more similar to MGS 3, with an emphasis on blending into the environment and slower movement. This stems from the guards' vision ranges. Even back in the earlier games, it felt a little strange how short-sighted all the soldiers were. Returning to this style after MGS 3 would have been practically impossible, without making the game seem like a huge step backwards. 
This isn't to say the gameplay in those games was worse, it's totally reasonable to prefer one style over another, I just understand why the team wouldn't want to go back to it. The realistic nature of the setting wouldn't combine very well with the guards from MGS1. The Octo Camo suit is a bit of a stroke of genius, rectifying one of the major problems with MGS3, the menu usage. In MGS3 the camo menu interrupted the action from time to time depending on how often the player wanted to change clothes to match the environment. The menu itself provided simple positive or negative numbers to lead the player to the correct camo choice for any situation, removing all thought from the process. You go into the menu, look for the best numbers and use those. Instead of dealing with any of that, Solid Snake just needs to rest in one place for a moment and the Octo Camo does the rest. It was pretty impressive how well the Camo Index worked in MGS3, but the team have outdone themselves here with the number of textures that can be applied to the Octo Camo. Of the four major menus present in MGS3, only the Equipment menu survives, although this is now split up between items, weapons and the shop. It's still far less intrusive overall, but these menus might not have been necessary if not for the unusual emphasis on firearms. Drebin the gun dealer is introduced pretty early on and gives Snake access to all sorts of weaponry and customizations. While the point system is an interesting addition, I can't help but feel the gun shop misses the entire point of Metal Gear, stealth. Not only that, but the guns are all fairly similar functionally. MGS1 handled the weapon system the best by usually having only one gun of each type. Anything more really isn't necessary for a series like this. It's not that I think these weapons and customizations detract from the game, I just think that manpower could have been put to far better use. This first chapter takes place in the middle of a combat zone and Otacon makes it clear that Snake isn't on either side of the engagement. This means actions against one side will make Snake favourable to the other, but this mechanic never really gets any time to shine. Snake makes it clear at the start that war is no longer about ideologies, so this makes it impossible to paint either faction as the bad guys. All other things being equal, I think it's human nature to back the underdog. This makes the rebels, with their inferior weapons and technology, the clear favourite. Not only that, but the level design favours them as well. Snake always starts on the rebel side of the engagements, putting the PMC soldiers in the way of the objective. It's obvious who most players are going to favour. It's a shame because having Snake trapped in a conflict he's impartial about is an interesting concept. More branching level design could have really capitalised on this idea. The emphasis as always is on stealth, but being discovered is less punishing than it ever has been. Enemies are often incapable of calling in reinforcements and are slow to move away from the front lines of battle, which makes it easier than ever to run away and let an alert phase die down without taking much damage. Alert phases used to be highly tense, potentially game ending moments, but now function more as an inconvenience. Avoiding detection is functionally the same as it's ever been, but it's made a little less satisfying since the results of failure aren't nearly as pronounced. This can be rectified somewhat by playing on the higher difficulties. As always, the codec returns again, this time changed to give a fully rendered view of Otacon during these scenes. It's a nice touch how the codec has a different incarnation for each instalment, and obviously this MGS4 version is the most advanced of the lot. I particularly like the way the equaliser on the left hand side is matched up correctly with the audio. More important though, Otacon can now communicate with Snake while the game is in motion, which helps guide the player in the usual Metal Gear fashion without disrupting the flow. Snake's first objective is to rendezvous with Rap Patrol Team 1, and the first one he runs into is Johnny, better known by his codename Liquid Poop. <coughs> I've never been one for scatological humour, but I can at least understand that Johnny's inclusion here is tradition at this point. Unfortunately though, he takes a much larger role in this game than ever before. He's part of Meryl's team and she gets introduced not long after. Snake and Meryl's relationship is much the same as it ever was, but it's disheartening to see the accelerated aging place an old Snake with a still young Meryl. It's clear their relationship never worked out, but this seems to be the final punctuation mark on it all. Meryl gives a rundown of the SOP system here, which turns out to be a critical element to the plot. In fact, it's Liquid's goal to gain control of the system. Nano machines have been in use since at least the Shadow Moses incident, so it's not insane to think they would proliferate into soldiers across the globe during the following decade, especially with the Patriots pushing their adoption. Merrill's naivety about the system contrasts well with Snake's dislike of it, especially considering his newfound old age. Apart from the Octo Camo suit, he hasn't adopted much new technology over the past decade, whereas the world has been steadily advancing. As he says himself, he's a relic. Their reunion is interrupted by a battle with the frogs, a new soldier type introduced in this game. Interestingly, all the frogs are women, whereas none of the basic enemies were ever female in the previous instalments of the series. This is such a jarring change that I can't help but feel Kojima is making some sort of statement with him. 
Perhaps it's to show that the global conflict has become so destructive and prolonged that women have been pulled into combat service more as the men die out. It's also noteworthy that the frogs almost always appear during sequences where it's much, much more difficult for the player to use non-lethal methods. During regular gameplay, the tranquilizer gun is a decent option, but the frogs appear in bulk and in situations where the player is under more pressure. Again, I'm just speculating here, but I wonder if this was to see how much a player's moral compass will erode under pressure. I can't imagine I'm the only person who tried to use mostly non-lethal methods on my first playthrough, but wound up using machine guns against some of the frogs. The bosses this time are mostly women too, and are introduced shortly after the frog sequence in a moment not too dissimilar from the bridge scene in MGS3, where they each make an entrance and display their powers. It's a promising display of their abilities, making it clear that Snake is going to be in some serious trouble when he runs into one, but that doesn't happen until the second chapter. It makes for a great action sequence though, one of many to follow. There's only a little more sneaking before Snake gets face to face briefly with Liquid and Naomi returns as well. This is all just a teaser of things to come before closing out the first chapter. MGS4 is broken down into five distinct chapters, which simultaneously becomes one of the game's biggest strengths and one of its greatest weaknesses. From the moment the player loses control at the end of Act 1, to the moment they regain control at the start of Act 2 is about half an hour, and that's excluding the install time. The mission briefing scenes on board the Nomad eat up a huge amount of time. Over the course of the entire story, about an hour is spent watching these briefings occur. Mostly nothing but people sitting around and talking about the mission objectives. With MGS3, Kojima dialed back the use of cutscenes and codec conversations somewhat, but here they're back in force, often even more time consuming than the worst offences in MGS2. Metal Gear Solid really pushed the cinematic angle of storytelling in games and earned Kojima a lot of goodwill. I know I'm more willing to forgive indulgent cutscene use in the Metal Gear series than I am anywhere else, because it's expected at this point, and it also feels like MGS1 earned Kojima the right to turn that into his style. Even so, Kojima crosses a line with the insane amount of cutscene use in this game. Here's a quick breakdown of the cutscenes at the start. Including the television spots at the beginning, there's about 20 minutes of cutscenes until the player resumes control after the first Gecko encounter. After that, the Mark II, Drebin, and Johnny are introduced. Drebin's one alone is 15 minutes, and put together that accounts for about another 20 minutes total. The meeting with Merrill's team is a continuous 17 minute cutscene, after which they part ways and Snake talks on the codec for a bit, making a total of 23 minutes. The intro to the B&B members is 4 minutes long, and the scene with Liquid and Naomi is 9 minutes long. The mission briefing for Act 2 is about 12 minutes, and then the intro to the act itself is another 10 minutes. All told, by the time the player resumes control at the start of Act 2, they've watched over 90 minutes of cutscenes and codec conversations. For comparison's sake, all of the mandatory cutscenes and codec conversations during the tanker chapter of MGS2 take up 45 minutes. After 90 minutes of cutscenes, Raiden is just about to start hunting down the bombs planted around the big shell. MGS3 front-loaded many of its cutscenes and radio conversations, but even so, after 90 minutes, Snake has completed the Virtuous mission and met up with Eva, after which the game is about to really kick in. These interruptions were bad in the previous games, but MGS4 is even worse, and it's only getting started. Games, by definition, are interactive, so asking a player to put down the controller for half an hour runs in opposition to the entire point of the medium. I'm not saying the entire experience needs to focus on action. One of the main objectives here is to give closure to many of the series' plot threads, which is a worthy goal. Some genres, like RPGs or visual novels, have an even larger focus on narrative than MGS4, but they have a tendency to at least feel somewhat player-driven, because they often allow the player to explore the story at their own pace, or make decisions which affect the outcome. The cutscenes in MGS4 aren't player-driven at all. It's a completely linear track akin to watching a film. The Metal Gear experience is essentially a movie and a game spliced together. You could lobby this complaint at a lot of modern games, but it's especially problematic here because of the skewed ratio between gameplay and cutscene. Eventually, after much talk, the second chapter kicks off in South America, where Snake needs to get in touch with Naomi. Liquid's plan is also made clear at this point, controlling the PMCs is a way for him to bring Big Boss's vision of Outer Heaven to life. Once Snake arrives in the forest, Vamp returns, since it was unfortunately too much to expect a bullet to the head to end him in MGS2. The first and second act follow the style of MGS3 very closely, including all its triumphs and problems. The open environments are nice, but as a result, headshots continue to be overpowered. CQC returns, but once again is a wholly optional addition, and doesn't expand on Snake's abilities a great deal. So far, the gameplay of MGS4 is just a streamlined version of MGS3, which is fine, because if there was anything MGS3 needed in that department, it was a bit of streamlining. 
The second act stresses this similarity even more than the first. Taking place in a forested region, this chapter imitates the environment of MGS3 somewhat. The levels become more open and although there's still a conflict going on, it's less prominent than the one in the Middle East. The psych meter becomes more of a factor here. The heat in the Middle East and South America will slowly increase Snake's stress level, but sticking to the shade will lower it back down. Naturally, this is harder to do out in the open areas of South America, so the player might need to do more to manage it here. High intensity situations will also increase Snake's stress meter, and the ultimate consequences of allowing it to get low are the same as the stamina meter from MGS3. It does a very good job of applying those same principles without relying on the rest of the survival system present in that game. Rose becomes Snake's contact for the psych meter and the colonel explains that she entered combat support during the Big Shell incident. Kojima attempts to wrap up so much stuff in this game but one thing he seems almost uninterested in tackling is the ending to MGS2, where Rose was somehow an AI during the mission but then showed up in the flesh at the end. During the ending however, she and everyone around Raiden seem to be ignoring the fact that Arsenal Gear just destroyed several blocks of New York City. Saying she entered combat support during the Big Shell incident implies that Raiden spoke to the real Rose at at least one point during the mission. But how long was she real and when was she replaced? If she was real then why was she cooperating with GW and who does she work for? Kojima's gone on record as saying he never initially intended to follow up MGS2 and it shows here. He just has no way of following up the Big Shell incident in a satisfying, coherent manner, so he glosses over almost everything related to it and moves on. Even though the events of MGS2 are largely glossed over, the very fact that MGS4 takes place afterwards and includes some of the same characters demystifies that game a great deal, which is a real shame. It's finally time to talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to Kojima. In the past, he claimed several times that he didn't want to work on the series anymore after MGS2. In fact, MGS2 was all about passing information on to the next generation because he wanted his team to make future Metal Gear installments without his help. So it seems possible he didn't even really want to make MGS2 in the first place either. Despite this, he continued to work on the series, eventually writing and directing MGS3 and 4. MGS4 is all about the series needing to be put to rest. Kojima sets up a scenario that Snake simply isn't coming back from. He's too old now to be pulled into any more conflicts and the progressing technology places him as the last of his kind. Even disregarding the fact that he has the biology of a 70 year old, there's little room in the Metal Gear world anymore for a special forces soldier who's still entirely human. Kojima tells us over and over again that there's nothing after this final mission for old Snake. During the ending sequence to MGS2, there's a moment where Snake speaks about passing information on to future generations. Kojima uses Snake as a mouthpiece to get his message across to the player, similar to the way Naomi speaks at the end of MGS1. This time around, Snake practically personifies Kojima. The man had been working on almost nothing but Metal Gear games for 20 years by the time MGS4 was being made. To put that in perspective, a person born after the release of the first Metal Gear would now be old enough to create a lengthy series of video reviews about Kojima's games. Now you might be wondering, if Kojima didn't want to make Metal Gear anymore, why didn't he just stop? It's true, he could have stopped at any time and got a job at virtually any studio he wanted, but the Metal Gear series is an entity all its own. Konami wouldn't just stop producing Metal Gear games if Kojima decided to stop working on the series. They'll continue to be made as long as they continue to sell. So Kojima's first idea was to try and prepare the team to work on them without his input. Apparently this didn't work out so well when they tried to make MGS3 and Kojima understandably didn't want to sit by and see the series go downhill as soon as he left, so he came back on board. In MGS4, war becomes routine to Metal Gear and Metal Gear becomes routine to Kojima. This time, rather than consider what his team will do after he leaves, he just wants it to end, so he sets about bringing finality to everything. As we're going to see over the course of the rest of this video, he does this by crafting an ending to the series that would satisfy as many fan desires as possible while closing off Solid Snake's story. One surefire way to satiate some fan desires is to introduce a cyborg ninja, which is exactly what Kojima does in the form of Raiden. He even makes a Kodak call warning Snake of an impending threat, recalling those moments from MGS 1 and 2. Chapter 2 is only kicking off at this point, but already many of the characters from previous installments have returned or been mentioned. Liquid, Naomi, Rose and Raiden have all returned and Mei Ling has been mentioned setting up her return later on. Of all the returning characters, Raiden has undergone the most drastic changes between MGS 2 and 4, but it's not until a while later that he shows up. Before that, Snake needs to crawl through more Warzone and make his way to Naomi. It's here that Snake's coffin is nailed shut when Naomi says the Fox Die virus is mutating, turning him into a time bomb that could wipe out humanity. 
Not only that, but his accelerated aging is incurable, so even though later in the story the fox die turns out not to be a problem, he's still on his way out in roughly six months' time. It's grim and a particularly bitter ending for the hero given the events of MGS1 painted a happier future for him. If the series hadn't continued past the first installment, then fans would have got the ending they really wanted for Snake as a character. Knowing Kojima, maybe that was part of the point. The Laughing Octopus fight follows immediately afterwards, and while it's not the most amazingly constructed fight of the series, it is decent. The main problem is that the Solid Eye is far too useful, easily giving away her position. The new aiming controls get utilised a lot here. Moving the fire button to R1 instead of square allows the player to keep their right thumb on the analog stick. This is basically a standard console first person shooter control scheme now. It feels more natural after playing shooters and gives Snake a greater degree of movement. While I think it's a good change in and of itself, I also think it's had a detrimental knock-on effect where a greater emphasis has been placed on shooting because of the improved controls. Previous bosses in the series could obviously take a lot of punishment, but their health bars usually lost a good chunk if the player managed to connect the decent shot. It was more about landing the right hits at the right time, unlike this fight with Laughing Octopus where Snake can empty half a magazine into her and only chip away at the life bar. When the player is on the offensive, there's nothing to distinguish this from a typical first-person shooter. Snake is stuck in close quarters with a boss, and initially this is a tense and interesting situation, but as it becomes more protracted it loses a lot of its edge, and by the end it can feel downright formulaic. The core concept of this boss is great, really fitting with the hide and seek theme, but a lower number of more high intensity engagements may have helped it to shine a little brighter. As it stands there are still some wonderful moments, where Octopus will imitate the Mark II, a dead frog, or even fake being Naomi. There's a couple of other ingenious ways she can hide as well. Laughing Octopus is part of the Beauty and the Beast unit, and once Snake chisels away the last remnants of her health bar, she loses her exoskeleton, revealing the beauty inside. It makes for a bit of a hammy metaphor. Her motion capture and body are based on a model. She's wearing a skin-tight suit, and the camera isn't shy about showing us every nook and cranny. The design of her bodysuit even makes it look vaguely like lingerie. Laughing Octopus takes her emotion from the Joy, aka the boss of MGS3. Her animal is taken from Decoy Octopus in MGS1, and she disguises herself in the environment not unlike how Decoy would go to great lengths to disguise himself. Her gun and tentacles come from Solidus in MGS2. She and the other members of the B&B unit are a mixture of the previous series bosses. All of this just seems like fan service. Mix up the previous bosses of the series and then have a model suggestively crawl around on the floor once it's done. There's a lot going on here though. For instance, when her exoskeleton first comes off, her underlying suit has a strange, almost gory looking texture to it. She then vomits black fluid everywhere. When Snake has to actually fight her, the audio seems to be from her encounter as a girl that gave her post-traumatic stress disorder. And rather than attacking Snake in a conventional manner, she simply hugs him and his life bar goes down. I'm not going to defend the personalities of the B&B unit because they're about as shallow if not worse than the Cobra unit from MGS3. But there's a lot of different elements at play which make me wonder what Kojima's intentions really were. Simple fan service or something more? I can't really say for sure. If there is anything more to this scenario, I imagine it's an attempt to create an uncanny, unsettling situation by mixing so many elements together. After all, that's what they accomplished so well in the opening television scenes at the start. The principle behind these and the B&B core is essentially the same. They take familiar things we know already and twist them just a little in order to make us feel uncomfortable. The screams during the latter half of the B&B fights can be a little disturbing, but overall I'd say the television at the start is a much greater success in this regard. They give us a fantastic glimpse into the dystopian world of MGS4, but the types of shows are all very standard television affair, which makes them relatable in a way. There's an interview, a quiz show, a cooking show, a nature program, and an infomercial. Everybody playing MGS4 has seen these types of things on TV. My particular favourites are the interview with David Hayter and the quiz show, where the hosts both talk over and ignore their guests, as I think this most accurately captures the innately impersonal nature of TV the best. While I think it's up in the air whether the B&B core were primarily designed for fan service or something deeper, I do think it's clear that much of the game does contain a lot of moments specifically designed to please fans. In fact, I think Kojima pokes at this issue in the interview with David Hayter when Lee Merriweather asks him why he's wearing an eye patch. I, what do you mean? Why are you here? Oh, well, I was hoping to promote my new movie. I'm just coming off of the set. No, David Hayter. Why here? Wearing an eye patch. The way she says this is incredibly deliberate. It seems almost like an accusation. As though she's saying, Yes, of course you're wearing an eye patch, David, because this is MGS4, and that's what the fans want to see. 
Although Kojima does a lot of pandering in this game, he's still capable of making bold decisions. It's amazing that he decided to spend so much time and energy on these clips when they only constitute 3 minutes of a player's playthrough, and the player can only fully watch one of 5 channels on any given go. It's perhaps even more amazing that nobody stopped him from doing this. After Laughing Octopus is taken down, Snake moves on to catching up with Naomi. The section in the woods where Snake has to follow footsteps is a nice way of mixing up the core gameplay, and if you ask me, it's a much better change of pace than the shooting section which comes after, because it fits with the stealth theme. That's not to say the shooting section is bad though, shooting down Gecko is satisfying and the scene as a whole is pretty well scripted. The zombified soldiers are a bit much, but at least they make sense in the context of the story. Raiden makes his triumphant return here, confirming that he is indeed going to play the role of the cyborg ninja this time around. It's a drastic shift in tone from his previous characterization, or more accurately, his intentional lack of characterization. Although the ending to MGS2 saw Raiden get the HF blade from Olga, it's a very abrupt change to be seeing. It's also somewhat of a role reversal for him and old Snake. Snake in MGS2 was by far the better soldier of the two, but now Raiden is capable of destroying multiple geckos in close quarters combat by himself something Snake would never be able to do. He proceeds to show off his new skills in one of the most impressive action sequences in the game. It's brilliantly choreographed. You could argue that this stuff goes on too long and you probably wouldn't be wrong, but at least it's visually interesting to look at. I know it held my interest a lot better than some of the other sequences like the mission briefings. To be fair, the mission briefing sequences do give the option of using some interactive elements, like changing the camera or using the Mark II, but it's little compensation considering how much time is spent in these. The one for Chapter 3 focuses on Naomi, and to a lesser extent Sunny. Since she's a child, Sunny's character is very one note, but at least she serves as a counterbalance to a mostly aging cast. Given how much of the world is destroyed, and the bleak television spots at the start of the game showing a disturbing world barely worth saving, it's worth having a kid around as a reminder of what Snake, Otacon and Raiden are trying to protect. Naomi displays some of her smarts here, but really anyone should know by now that having sex with Otacon is a death sentence. The little romance that blooms between them here is horribly awkward, but I guess that was part of the point. Keep in mind, Naomi knows she has a presumably incurable strain of cancer, and that she's probably going to end up killing herself in the not too distant future, but she decides to go ahead and get Otacon's hopes up anyway. So far, everything has been going pretty well. There's obviously a lot more interruptions than there should be, but despite this, MGS4 proves itself to be a more than entertaining and worthwhile expansion to the series so far. That's when Chapter 3 happens. It immediately gets off to a bad start when Snake decides to head into Eastern Europe, disguised as a younger version of himself. This then turns out not to even be necessary, since Meryl stops the guards from taking him away. This is all obviously just an amends to people for forcing them to play as an old, tired version of a beloved character. For the start of this chapter, you can at least pretend you're playing as the younger Solid Snake we all know and love. As far as I'm concerned, this is the precise moment where the fan service starts to spiral out of control. Although this chapter attempts to placate fans by giving them the face of Solid Snake, it changes up the gameplay to something not really seen in the series before, a mission where Snake has to tail a resistance member back to a hideout. This kind of sequence is pretty common in other games, even ones not focused on stealth, but it's not something that's really been seen in the Solid series before. I can appreciate it as a way of mixing up the gameplay a bit, and unlike a lot of the more specialised sections throughout the series, it's entirely focused on avoiding detection. If this section suffers from anything, it's a been there, done that mentality which might take hold because of how frequently it's used in other games, even though it's something relatively novel for the Metal Gear series. It's also much less enjoyable on repeat playthroughs because the resistance member limits the speed at which the player can proceed. Although this section doesn't have a lot going for it, it is pretty lengthy, there's a lot of ground to cover and there's virtually no interruptions along the way. Just remember, if you're ever a resistance member in a war-torn future where getting caught might get you killed, Whistle very loudly so Snake knows where you are. The reintroduction of Eva is a surprising turn, and although I ultimately feel it may not have been ideal or necessary, I at least understand Kojima's thought process behind it. With MGS2, he had never planned to answer the mysteries presented to the player at the end, so with MGS3 he chose to ignore most of that, go back into the past, and only barely mention the philosophers as a concept. MGS3 had virtually no explicit relevance to the rest of the series other than showing how Big Boss may have been inspired to create Outer Heaven. With MGS4, the fans would expect a resolution to everything, so Kojima had to prove the events of MGS3 weren't just a big waste of time. I don't think they were a big waste of time though. As I've said, that game just strived for an emotional, almost self-contained story, and it succeeded very well at that. With the boss, Kojima had crafted an extremely compelling character, so much so that it's perfectly acceptable to imagine her death had kicked off the entire series. 
Eva gives some lengthy exposition here about what happened after MGS3, eventually letting us know that all the major characters of MGS3 were the founders of the Patriots. Zero had become their leader and eventually clashed with Big Boss himself over the direction the organization should take. This is where the plot of MGS4 falls down the hardest. We're told that Zero, a guy who in the previous game was our contact and a pretty helpful one at that, has suddenly become the cause of all the problems in the series. Likewise, Paramedic, who seemed like nothing more than a slightly goofy but caring doctor, is suddenly the same person who did horrible experiments on Grey Fox. This is extremely important information and incredibly hard to believe given the way these people were characterised in MGS3. This could have made some sense if there was a game dedicated to the way these characters end up changing, but it's terrible writing to just drop this on us at the 11th hour and expect us to buy into it. There's a few major gaps in the series that have a detrimental impact on MGS4. This stuff with the Patriots, Raiden's transformation while saving Sunny after MGS2, and Snake's accelerated ageing. Although the former two are perhaps more important plot points, Snake's slide into old age is a particularly interesting idea. Instead of showing this taking place, MGS4 starts at a time when it's mostly already occurred. This is a big missed opportunity. Since the game unfolds over several acts, it would have been easy to place these acts chronologically further apart from each other and have Snake age between these segments. As for the other gaps, Kojima has shown interest in fleshing these parts of the saga out now, but really it's too late. I have no problem with a story jumping around chronologically. I quite like the fact that MGS3 was a prequel, but the story should always flow best or at least not feel like it has massive holes in it if it's played in release order. One of the other biggest problems with the story of MGS4 is the dialogue, and Big Mama is a particularly good example. Eva in MGS3 had been a pretty down-to-earth woman, at least around Naked Snake. Sure, she was a double agent, but she was always to the point, and you got the impression she had a goal to work towards. During the ending sequence, she makes a small reference to the biblical tale of Adam and Eve. Of course, the game had an Adam, an Eva, and a snake, so it was bound to go somewhere with it. Eva also asks earlier in the game if Snake is there to tempt her. It's a funny little moment, exactly like the one Otacon and Snake have at the end of MGS1, when they realise they're named the same as the main characters from 2001 A Space Odyssey. The important thing to note about Eva's tape at the end of MGS3 is that it makes sense. She simply uses the biblical reference to frame her own story of how she tricked Snake, that's all. It doesn't have any sort of deeper meaning. Jump into MGS4 and suddenly Eva is literally holding apples in a couple of scenes and saying stuff which makes no sense at all, like this bit here. My objective was to secure the location of the Philosopher's Legacy, a massive cache of hidden wealth, and report it to Beijing. I was to acquire a microfilm showing the location of secret funds, funds amassed by the Allied powers during World War II. But I failed in my mission and was expelled from China. I took the apple from the snake and was cast out of Eden. Eva is referring to the Snake Eater incident, but this doesn't make any sense. First of all, she was supposed to steal the Philosopher's Legacy, and she failed, after being tricked by Ocelot, aka Adam. Snake had nothing to do with any of this, and if we assume the apple is supposed to represent the Philosopher's Legacy, then the reason Eva was cast out of her country was because she didn't manage to take the apple like she was supposed to. It's all just thrown in here because the characters happen to be called Adam, Eva and Snake, but when you examine it, it makes no sense. The characters in MGS1 sometimes tended towards grandiose statements a bit too much, but at least even these made sense in their context. At times, particularly in the second half, the characters in MGS4 seem to talk in nothing but riddles, totally unlike the way human beings actually speak to one another. Later, when Eva is dying, she cryptically talks about shadows and light. Naomi never stops making vague statements about destiny and fate, presumably just because those were words she used at the end of MGS1 when they actually had some context. I get the feeling this may have been the fault of the translation from Japanese to English being done too literally, but I can't say for sure. This may have all been some sort of attempt to convey the main theme, which this time around is sense. Basically, this has been described by Kojima as someone's understanding of the world which is lost when they die, something that can't be passed on directly to future generations. If the characters are being cryptic, then this does at least tie into that theme. The sense theme isn't conveyed anywhere near as clearly as the themes of the other games, and once again, sense, just like scene, is a terrible word to try and get this across. Apparently, Kojima even applied this theme to Old Snake himself. It's always struck me how little Snake interacts with people in this game. He has very few proper conversations with characters and instead tends to passively absorb information. I've recently learned this was an intentional decision. In an interview with Kojima, he was asked the following question. Do you think one's sense truly can't be passed on? And I found his reply to illuminate much about Snake's character in MGS4. He replied, 
I think that even though you might not be able to describe something in words, it's important to show it indirectly. No matter how often a parent tells their child they shouldn't misbehave or that they should smarten up, the child usually doesn't listen, do they? So I had Snake, who continues to fight despite his old age, live by example instead of offering a direct message. It's like a father going out and working hard every day to provide for his child rather than simply telling them he loves them. In the game, Meryl and other characters tell old Snake he doesn't have to fight, that they'll take over for him. But Snake continues to fight. That's what he wants to pass on. Of course, they may not realise it while he's still alive. I found this to be a very insightful quote, but the problem is the game doesn't convey this itself. I mean, it's easy to see that Snake is pushing himself very hard to try and accomplish his mission, and he's a very heroic character, but his optimism from the previous game seemed to have vanished. There's no way for us to know, simply by playing the game, that Snake is pushing himself on because he cares for future generations. Instead, it just feels like he's going through the motions because it's all he's good at. While I think Snake's silence and the cryptic stylings of much of the dialogue may have come from a good place, ultimately they make for an unsatisfying script in a lot of places. The second half of the Eastern Europe section focuses on action, and while the chase scene is impressive to look at, it's not particularly enjoyable to play, especially considering the South America chapter had a very similar sequence not long earlier. In Chapter 3, the cramped roads and high speed don't work very well with a controller when it comes to aiming, and funnily enough the next boss fight suffers from the exact same problem. Since the game is exclusive to the PS3, it obviously needs to be controlled using a controller, and while I think dual analog sticks can work pretty well during shooting segments, they obviously have their limits. There's a fixed upper rate at which the player can spin the camera around, and this causes problems if enemies aren't positioned carefully. During the fight with the Rage, the drones and even the boss herself can move very freely through the air. From the player's point of view, they're moving on a 2D plane, which already makes them more difficult to track than the average enemy, which generally only moves horizontally relative to the player. The environment is pretty cramped as well. If the player moves outside, there's barely any room between Snake and the edge of the balcony, which makes for a very cluttered viewpoint and forces the player to be quite close to the enemies. Naturally, the closer a player is to something, the more quickly it will move on screen, making it harder to track. On top of all this, the enemies can change their flight path extremely quickly in mid-air, further complicating matters. I'm no stranger to console shooters, in fact I've probably played more shooters on consoles than I have with a mouse and keyboard. I feel like this section is ill-fitted for a gamepad though, the enemies are aggravatingly hard to target, and this problem simply wouldn't exist were the game being played on a mouse, or had the enemy placement been more carefully considered. It just goes to show that shooting has never been the series' strong point. For these reasons, I think Raven is among the worst bosses in the entire series. It doesn't help that, like all the other members of the B&B core, she lacks any sort of depth, and her fight is the most action-orientated of them all. Laughing Octopus takes a lot longer to chip down compared to the other series bosses, but Raging Raven probably takes twice as much damage as Laughing Octopus, making it even worse. The fight lacks much of an identity as well. There's none of those clever little tricks the series is known for, or any really identifiable way of inflicting a lot of damage at once, at least not on the first playthrough. It makes for a pretty disappointing conclusion to a pretty disappointing chapter. Drebin chimes in again after the Raven fight to tell Snake another bedtime story. It's his only valuable function as a character. So in other words, Drebin has no valuable function as a character. Let's ignore the bedtime stories for a moment and focus on Drebin. He has no real reason to exist when you realise it wouldn't have been hard to justify Otacon unlocking weapons using some computer magic, perhaps by using acquired IDs to break the protection on the guns, thus even keeping the point system in play. He gives Snake a newer generation of nano machines, which probably could have been done by Naomi, and last but not least he has a monkey. If they really wanted to keep the monkey, then maybe they could have just said Sonny's dad's bought her one as a present. Considering how much this game needed to wrap up, it was a bit pointless to introduce a character like Drebin who is barely expanded upon at all, even though he manages to talk endlessly. He could have easily been replaced by Otacon or other characters most of the time. The stories he tells after the B&B fights are equally pointless. I can only assume it was a way to try and capture the sort of deathbed conversations which happened in MGS1, but it fails completely because the bosses have no character and their history is explained by someone else after they're dead. It doesn't help that their origin stories are all extremely similar. Some young girl is living in a town, something sadistic happens to her, and she snaps as a result. It's tragic and relatable, sure, but it's samey after you've heard it once. It doesn't bear repeating four times. It's ridiculously contrived as well, because there's absolutely no way that Drebin could know all the stuff he tells Snake. It's as though he had a first-person perspective on all these events. Either he's embellishing quite a lot of the details, or somehow they figured out what was happening in the heads of the B&B members when their tragedy struck. Again, Otacon or Rose could have easily replaced Drebin here. Just say they dug up some info on them and go from there. 
From the moment Raven goes down until the moment the player resumes control at the start of Act 4 is an hour. This is the midpoint of the story where Snake meets up with Ocelot who explains part of his plan. GW is inside the Patriot system and under his control. In this hour we're subjected to every major sin that Kojima has ever committed in his writing. There's overly long explanations, vague attempts at metaphors that fall apart under scrutiny, wonky dialogue, people being overly cryptic, and just plain stupid decisions like when Meryl ignites a romance with liquid poop. In this hour only a couple of major things happen. Liquid explains how GW will help him take down the Patriots AI and he then displays the control he has over the system by deactivating everyone's guns. These are crucial plot elements so they need to be in here. Big Mama dies and the corpse of Solidus is burned. Big Mama has served her purpose in the story and it's dramatic to have such a big death at this point so this is fine as well. Solidus' corpse is mainly used to trick the player into thinking Big Boss is gone for good. Again this serves a valuable purpose. Lastly we learn that Liquid is going back to Shadow Moses to seize Rex so he can destroy the main AI and take control. Vital plot information. Everything else that happens here could be trimmed down significantly or removed with very little detrimental impact. It takes Kojima half the length of an average film to get these few points across and even comparing it to a film is generous since someone watching a film isn't simultaneously waiting for a game to start back up. When the corpse gets burned on the boat, Big Mama is incredibly distraught and ends up running into the fire in a vain attempt to rescue him. Presumably this is because she doesn't know he's Solidus and not Big Boss. They would be genetically identical, so a test of that sort would fool them into thinking it's the corpse of Big Boss, and that's why the corpse is still valuable to Liquid. There is another test they could do to confirm whether this was Solidus or Big Boss though. They could look at him. Solidus and Big Boss were missing different eyes, and sure enough the corpse they have in their possession is missing its left eye instead of the right confirming at a glance that this is actually Solidus. It's not like Eva forgot this detail either, because she briefly hallucinates that Snake is Big Boss, and even though Snake has the solid eye on his left eye, her imagination moves the patch over to his right eye, because she clearly remembers Big Boss very well. She has no reason to be this upset when the corpse catches fire. Before I started doing these reviews I would think of the story in the Metal Gear Solid series with its convoluted plot, and figure it has plot holes and inconsistencies but at least it's a fun story. I had just sort of assumed, because the stories were so complicated at times, that the series must have a lot of holes in it. During my re-examination of the games when I could no longer leave anything to assumption, I was pleased to find that this isn't really the case. It's difficult to think of anything in MGS 1, 2 or 3 that isn't explained to some degree, apart from a few things which are deliberately left as mysteries. Ocelot's motives, the identities of the philosophers or the patriots, these sort of things are left unresolved, but deliberately so. I'm sure if I dug hard enough I'd find a couple of problems which couldn't easily be explained away. For example the Solidus thing in MGS2 where it seems like quite a stretch that nobody realised the president was an exact clone of Big Boss. By and large though I was surprised at how well the story holds up under scrutiny. MGS4 on the other hand does have some inconsistencies and problems which I think are mainly caused by trying to cram in too many characters from the previous games and attempting to explain things which Kojima didn't have an answer for until MGS4 rolled around like Ocelot's motives. Ocelot, Liquid Ocelot or Liquid, whatever you want to call him, he gets a greatly expanded role in this game. In previous entries he was always more of a side villain, eclipsed by Liquid, Solidus and Vol'jin, and I think he worked best placed in this role. He was always an unknown element, something unpredictable you could never really be sure of, and that made him a compelling character. In MGS4 he has a much larger focus, but retains a sort of mystique about his actions and motivations until the end. By this point Ocelot has largely been taken over or merged with the personality of Liquid, but it's never really felt like Liquid to me. Perhaps because Liquid had such distinct voice acting in MGS1, it's hard to see him if that's absent and the total change of appearance doesn't help either. It's explained in MGS4 that Ocelot intentionally took on the persona of Liquid to fool the Patriot system, but it's never made clear why he would need to do this in order to accomplish any of the stuff he does over the course of any of the games. In fact given the way the Patriots AI seems to perceive threats, you could argue it's more likely that Ocelot would be perceived as less of a threat to the system since he was one of the founding members of the group. There are a couple of other little problems too, for example Snake seems surprised when he's told he's not an exact match for the DNA of Big Boss, even though this was the entire reason Liquid wanted to kill him on Shadow Moses. Neither your genetic pattern nor Liquid's genetic pattern is a 100% match for Big Boss's. <coughs> what do you mean we don't match? He explained very clearly that Snake and he received a separate set of genes, and he's annoyed because he thinks Snake got the dominant genes. 
Later in the game, when Meryl and Johnny are under attack, she's surprised to find that he has no nanomachines. But earlier in the game, she communicates with her team via these nanomachines. It's one of the main reasons they work so well together. Meryl should have known that Johnny had no nanomachines when she couldn't communicate with him. Apart from the problem with Meryl and Johnny, the focus on nanomachines doesn't really form any inconsistencies itself, but it's a woefully unsatisfying way to explain some stuff, like Vamp's immortality. The immortality he seemingly possesses is about the only interesting thing about Vamp as a character, and it's explained away as little robots in his blood. Similarly, later on it's shown that Screaming Mantis controls her victims using their nanomachines. Had the series been built from the ground up to explain all these interesting boss powers away with a nanomachines twist in the final chapter, that could have been a very interesting turn of events. The problem here is that many of the powers shown still can't be explained by any normal means. Fortune deflects a huge amount of missiles at the end of MGS2. Vamp runs on water, Vulcan Raven paralyzes Snake using some sort of spirit raven, and the entire cast of MGS3 exists in a time before nanomachines can be used to explain everything. The series has always included some supernatural elements. MGS1 handled this the best by having Psychomantis as the only boss focused on the paranormal, and even then he fits some idea of how a psychic soldier would look and operate. You could argue MGS2 was just a VR simulation, at least until MGS4 came along and contradicted that notion. Even in MGS3 though, when it's nearly impossible to explain this stuff away, I doubt anyone really cared anymore about supernatural bosses in the Metal Gear Solid series. And some unexplainable moments have really been used to enhance the experience at the cost of reality. At this point, it's totally fruitless to try explaining some stuff away with nanomachines, and even MGS4 itself has elements which can't easily be explained by them. Fighting the beauties is a good example. There's a distortion effect on screen, the screams of their traumatic events, and flower petals everywhere. If Screaming Mantis was causing this stuff to appear in Snake's vision, then injecting him with the syringe should stop it, as it stops her other powers from working, but instead it persists. Psycho Mantis' appearance later on can't be explained by Nanos either, as he's essentially a ghost. Although it's not vital to the plot, one part of the Act 3 conclusion I'll defend is the conversation between Snake and Raiden back on board the Nomad. Snake's moments around Raiden are some of the only meaningful interactions he has with anyone in the entire game. He seems to genuinely care a lot about Raiden, and I think this is fueled by guilt, knowing that Raiden was trained in his image. It's the closest Snake ever comes to recapturing that spark he had as a character in the previous games. Raiden is perhaps the most tragic character in the whole Metal Gear Solid saga, and considering Solidus ends up like this, and Otacon ends up a weeping mess at the end of every game, that's saying something. In MGS2, he had seemed out of his depth, and he only manages to surpass Snake once he's been turned into a cyborg, with much of his humanity lost. He starts out as a child soldier, and by the end he's probably nothing more than a spinal column and a brain in a robot body. The extreme lengths he goes through during some of the fights just serves to highlight how little he cares about his own welfare. This is all a surprisingly grim way of showing what happens to a person who tries to follow in the footsteps of a so-called legendary hero. It's no wonder that Snake would feel some guilt about Raiden's situation. Stories are usually character-driven or plot-driven, with an emphasis placed on one or the other. MGS4 is very much plot-driven. The events unfolding are generally given more precedence than the effects those events have on the characters themselves. Raiden is a clear exception to this, though. A lot of the scenes he's in focus purely on the emotional toll some events have had on him. His transformation seems a little forced, and you could argue it tramples all over the ending to MGS2, but at least this emphasis on his character makes him more interesting than many of the other cast members in MGS4. Every Metal Gear has been mostly plot-driven, but the character moments were a lot stronger in MGS1 and 3. One good comparison is Naomi. The scene in MGS4 where she explains about the fox die in Snake's body is used merely as a way of advancing the story. In MGS1, her explanation about fox die eventually leads into an emotional confession about wanting Snake dead because of her connection to Grey Fox. Perhaps MGS1 and 3 were better able to craft moments like this because they used a fresh set of faces. Naomi in MGS4 can't have another emotional breakdown about Grey Fox because it's already been done. Without these pivotal character moments, it becomes harder to get invested in the plot of MGS4. Act 4 begins with an emulation of Metal Gear Solid 1 in a fun little sequence where Snake turns out to be dreaming. This isn't just for fun though. Most Metal Gear Solid fans have a lot of reverence for MGS1, so this is a little reminder about how much they enjoyed that game before Snake is reintroduced to the Shadow Moses complex. The moment when the facility comes into view is handled brilliantly by playing the best is yet to come, which was used in some of the more important scenes in that game.
It had been 10 years since the release of the original Metal Gear Solid, and seeing Shadow Moses reimagined two generations of consoles later makes for an impressive moment. The facility also has some flashback audio to conversations from the Shadow Moses incident when Snake walks to various points in the level. Items are placed in a couple of locations to draw players towards these. These are handled superbly, but it's a little disappointing that the audio in use is from the Twin Snakes version of MGS1, which was released on the GameCube. The voice acting in that version was considerably weaker than the original, and some of the voice actors had changed. For example, Grey Fox sounded totally different. Apparently this was done because the audio quality was higher, but I find it hard to believe anyone would care. Even if they did, it would be tough to notice given how heavily the echo effect on it modifies the sound. By using the gameplay from MGS1, but the audio from the Twin Snakes, they're almost guaranteed to only completely please a small number of fans. I don't want to get into a whole debate on this, but I consider the original MGS1 to be the definitive version of that game for various reasons, and I would have gladly sacrificed some audio quality to hear the original Grey Fox instead. The music in the Metal Gear Solid series has always been, well, solid. In particular, it captures that nice difference between alert, evasion and normal phase as well. Some of the cutscenes were scored particularly well too. The ending to MGS3 had a nice rendition of the main series theme as Snake learns the truth about the boss. Her life would be ended by her most beloved disciple. That was the way the government wanted it. That was the mission she was given. And she had no choice but to carry it out. Unfortunately, between the release of MGS3 and MGS4, Konami came under some flack over possible plagiarism with regards to the main theme. A work by a Russian composer sounds very similar, and it seems the main motif of the series may have been taken from his work. Here's a quick comparison. As a result of this similarity, it doesn't appear in MGS4, when it probably would have been put to best use. I haven't found the series' music to be an integral part of the experience, but it certainly has some great tracks. In MGS4, some of the more iconic tracks are reused, here on Shadow Moses and later during the final boss. I imagine had this controversy not come to light, the main theme would have been used during at least one of the more dramatic sequences. I certainly don't condone plagiarism at all, but I think it's a real shame that the main theme was never used in MGS4. It had been woven into the DNA of the series over multiple installments. If there's any point that would have demanded a reprisal of that music, it would have been the end of Solid Snake's story. Although it's obviously amazing they rebuilt much of Shadow Moses just for one chapter of MGS4, there is a hollow feeling to it which undermines the entire thing. Just as Snake is getting old, Shadow Moses has gotten old too, and when Snake sees a camera on the wall, getting a brief flashback before it falls off its hinge and shatters on the ground, it's easy to see that Shadow Moses is dying in a way as well. In fact, Mei Ling even mentions that the entire archipelago is slipping into the ocean. This whole area captures the feel of getting older. That desire to return to things as they were before is indulged, but just as in real life, you can't turn back the clock. The atmosphere here is great, and the complete lack of life is a particularly good touch. Instead of guards, Snake needs to avoid the gecko and dwarf gecko. It makes for a wonderful juxtaposition to see this new technology wandering around a familiar environment. The world has moved on and left Snake and Shadow Moses behind. The robots naturally act very different from the human enemies of MGS4. Their patrol paths and limited sensing range in a way help them to mimic the guards of the original Metal Gear Solid. Getting caught here is also incredibly punishing compared to other areas of the game, because the dwarf gecko are hard to lose and the larger gecko can deal serious amounts of damage to Snake very quickly. Again, this mimics MGS1 somewhat, where getting caught was a life or death situation. This would all be great if not for some very poor enemy placement in this chapter which makes the environment far more cramped than it needed to be. The annoying dwarf gecko enemies absolutely swarm the place so it feels claustrophobic at times, really stopping the player from enjoying the scenery of Shadow Moses. You could argue that the tightly packed environment and annoying enemies are an intentional decision to make Shadow Moses an unsatisfying experience, after getting our hopes up just moments before. Games suffer from an image problem, where fun is sometimes touted as the only thing worth playing a game for. In reality, I think it's perfectly valid for a game to frustrate a player or disappoint them if that's what they're going for. 
In fact, the depressing atmosphere of Shadow Moses is one of my favourite things about MGS4. Broader experiences are a good thing, nobody watches a serious drama film to have fun. Traditionally though, games are supposed to be enjoyable to play at all times, and because of this when a game frustrates a player or disappoints them, it's considered a failing. You could point to a lot of messy areas of MGS4 and say maybe you're not supposed to enjoy it. For example, the story seems to trample on each of the previous installments of the Solid series. MGS2's VR angle is thrown out the window, the support team from MGS3 are twisted into villains, and the protagonist of MGS1 is dying and lacks much of his previous character. Maybe this is supposed to be unenjoyable, maybe MGS4 is nothing more than Kojima's revenge for having to continue the series so long. Maybe it's a brilliant piece of meta-narrative surpassing MGS2. Unfortunately, there's no way of knowing for sure, and there were ample clues in MGS2 about the true nature of its story, but those clues seem absent in MGS4, or at least not given to the same degree. Without a clear intention, then I have to assume that Shadow Moses was attempting to be enjoyable and failed, otherwise it seems like nothing but a weak excuse for a disappointing piece of gameplay. There are times when it feels like MGS4 suffers from a similar problem to MGS1 when it comes to level design. The artists obviously put a huge amount of work into this game compared to the others, crafting five distinct settings, but it rarely feels like these are used to their fullest before Snake elopes off to some other part of the world. There's a lot of different environments and many of these are quite large, but there's still only a few hours of gameplay once it's all added together. Just like MGS1, I feel the game would have benefited from a bit more time spent in each area, since it's less costly to just add to an existing place than create a new one. There's also an increased emphasis on set pieces from about the halfway mark, when really chapters 1 and 2 offer some of the best gameplay in the whole thing because they focus on the basic stealth concept. This is now combined with an obvious lack of cohesion as the setting jumps around the world and the mission briefings break everything up to an extraordinary degree. As a result, MGS4 can feel like it has even less content than the previous games in the series, when in reality it has more stealth gameplay than any other entry except maybe MGS3, as well as a host of other set pieces and events. Shadow Moses is a particularly impressive section of the game and the snow effects here are every bit as worthy of praise as the rain effects from MGS2. In other games, the designers might worry about the snow obscuring the player's vision, but MGS4 goes all out, sometimes becoming a pure haze of white. This creates a much more immersive environment than it would be otherwise. Snake ends up fighting Crying Wolf in these harsh weather conditions and they make the fight more interesting than it would be without them. Unfortunately, the night vision mode on the solid eye circumvents the weather a little too much, highlighting all the frog members and even Crying Wolf whenever she's vulnerable. The frog members put far more pressure on Snake than there would be otherwise, which is probably for the best. It stops this feeling like a repeat of the end from MGS3. Laughing Octopus had some interesting moments, but the gameplay was a bit of a letdown, devolving into something resembling a first-person shooter. Crying Wolf is the opposite. Mechanically, this fight is very sound. It plays into the default MGS4 gameplay and just requires the player to use a sniper rifle a couple of times when they get the right chance. Sometimes simplicity is key. Even though this fight lacks some of the more clever elements from other fights in the series, it's easily the best fight with any of the B&B &B members. I'm a bit of a cynic, so a lot of the stuff in MGS4 sets off alarm bells for me saying that the team were merely pandering to fan wishes a lot of the time. The Crying Wolf fight obviously harkens back to Sniper Wolf from MGS1, but for some reason I get the feeling this is actually an attempt to improve on what they were capable of doing back then. The Sniper Wolf fight did an admirable job with the limited hardware it had, but the Crying Wolf fight feels unrestricted. It feels like the team were finally able to do what they wanted to do years ago, and I'm glad they gave themselves a chance. I even get this impression in the ending cutscene where the wolf takes away her corpse. I imagine this is a recycled idea from MGS1 that they just weren't able to do back then. I don't know if I'm right, but either way it works, and the Crying Wolf stuff feels less like shameless nostalgia grabbing than a lot of the other moments in the game. Speaking of nostalgia, directly after the fight, Otacon brings him up over the codec. Hold it, Snake. Time to change the disc. I know, I know, it's a pain. But you need to swap disc 1 for disc 2. You see the disc labeled 2? No. Uh, no. Huh? Oh, wait. We're on PlayStation 3. It's a Blu-ray disc. Dual layered, too. No need to swap. Damn it, Otacon. Get a grip. <laughs> yeah, what an age we live in, huh, Snake? Wonder what they'll think of next. Yeah, I wonder what they'll think of next. Maybe seven minute install screens? Just uh, out of curiosity, let's see how long it takes me to get up and change the disc. Okay, hang on a second. Okay, hang on. Open the case. Ejected disc one. Put in disc 2. Close the lid. Press the start button. 
Yeah, I think I have about five minutes to spare now. MGS4 has some of the worst install times I've ever seen, but to be honest, they didn't bother me all that much. The game is already very broken up by design, so it's not like they contribute much to that. The PS3 comes equipped with a relatively slow disk read speed, so I can see how these installs may have been necessary. In fact, the install times would most likely still be necessary even if the game shipped on multiple discs instead. That said, it's moronic to brag about the benefits of new technology when they're not really being put to use in that way. Install times could have been removed by sacrificing some of the graphical fidelity or audio quality had this been a priority for the team, but apparently it wasn't. I love how MGS4 looks, but I'd be willing to look at a slightly less pretty game to have a smoother experience, and the same goes for the audio quality. This all serves as a good example of how hardware improves, but the ways in which it's been put to use haven't necessarily changed in the last 15 years. Not long after Crying Wolf, Snake ends up fighting Vamp. This boss fight is extremely similar to the Vamp fight from MGS2, but even more simplistic, and lacking some of the more interesting elements of that fight, such as Vamp dancing around on the railings above. It's very easy and acts mostly as a puzzle for the player to figure out how to make Vamp mortal. This fight doesn't add much to the game, but at least it's better to have it here as a boss than subject the player to another cutscene where Snake does all the work instead. Eventually, Raiden and Vamp end up dueling on top of Metal Gear Rex while Snake holds the Suicide Gecko at bay. This sequence uses a split-screen setup where the player controls Snake on the left-hand screen and the battle between Raiden and Vamp happens over on the right. I wonder if this was always the intended setup here, or if the animators went overboard and then realised they shouldn't make players sit through such a long fight scene when there had already been a few. Whatever the motivations for this, I think it really works. The only real problem is how much focus the shooting takes for the player, meaning they might miss most of the action over on the other screen, wasting a lot of the animator's work. You could even say this enhances the experience though, Snake wouldn't be able to watch the battle unfold either. The player might look over and only get a rough idea of who seems to be winning or losing as the fight progresses. This can heighten the tension in a way. The following cutscene where Vamp and Naomi die is pointlessly dramatic. With the exception of maybe Vol'jin, Vamp has been the least likeable villain this series has ever produced. He shows a disgusting amount of enjoyment in his work and his stupid penis knife just goes to show how one-dimensionally evil he is. He butchers Raiden twice in MGS4 and he's never done a single thing across the series to make the audience like him. Suddenly here it seems we're supposed to care about his death as Naomi laments his suffering. Sometimes the villains in the Metal Gear games would offer insight into their motivations before passing away, fleshing them out a lot and making it questionable just how much they deserve to die. Even in death, Vamp lacks any sort of redemption, robbing Otacon of his chance to get revenge at the last moment. This would all be fine if not for the way this scene is framed, giving us the impression we're supposed to care about this monster for some reason. Naomi's death is a little better, she offers a handful of platitudes before she goes, and then she and Otacon have an emotional goodbye. Every game Otacon's in, he loses someone he cares about, although his connection to Naomi is pretty questionable considering how little the two know each other. Keep in mind they never communicated during the Shadow Moses incident, it seems a bit much to imagine they would care about each other as much as they seem to. I suppose you could say the same about Sniper Wolf in MGS1, but the difference is she never showed any real interest in Otacon, so it may have been unrequited for all we know. The circumstances were very different as well. He was in a dangerous situation, and she was an exotic, trained killer, part of the team who took over his facility. A combination of Stockholm Syndrome and just plain infatuation could lead to some pretty strong feelings in the moment. Anyway, the next part is a satisfying sequence where Metal Gear Rex, now under the player's control, stomps all over a load of Gecko in the hallway. It's particularly enjoyable given what a daunting enemy the Gecko are in any other circumstance, but it's nothing compared to what happens next, when Liquid leaps out of the ocean in Metal Gear Ray, and the two battle it out in their respective mechs. To me, this feels like the computer game equivalent of taking two of your favourite toys and smashing them together, while making dinosaur noises. It's also a clever parallel to the fight Snake and Liquid had on Shadow Moses years before. Snake got Big Boss's recessive genes, while Liquid got the dominant ones. The science here is dubious since recessive genes aren't necessarily worse ones in a lot of cases, but the point they were making was Snake was the inferior clone. Here, Snake has the inferior Metal Gear, and in fact, Ray was designed as an anti-Metal Gear weapon, but Snake ultimately triumphs over Liquid again. The fight itself is about all you could ask for from a confrontation between two Metal Gears. Rex is equipped with three different weapons, and while the combat isn't especially deep, it is very satisfying. They really nailed the feel of this, giving Rex just enough weight to feel heavy, but not so much that it becomes a burden to control. Watching the two mechs grapple with each other is especially entertaining. 
Playing MGS4, it's surprisingly easy to forget that the impetus for the events has traditionally been the development of a new Metal Gear that the protagonist needs to destroy. This time there's no such threat, so Ray is recycled. It's strange to think that this is the closest the game comes to those climactic mech battles that define the end of the other games. It's probably more enjoyable than any of the other mech fights, but in a way it feels less dramatic since Snake has a Metal Gear of his own with which to fight back. Contrasted with MGS2 where Raiden took on multiple raids by himself, it feels like Snake is bound to win from the start. Liquid eventually taunts Snake a little before revealing his floating fortress, complete with its own Mount Snake more lining the top. I don't know what can be said about that, so I'm just gonna move on. Raiden once again undergoes a sacrifice here, cutting off an arm in order to rush to Snake's defense. Eventually he ends up getting crushed by the ship, leading us to believe he's probably dead. This closes the curtain on Chapter 4. The mission briefing for Chapter 5 takes place on board Mei Ling's ship as they try to catch up with Liquid in the middle of the ocean. It's an all too long sequence where they explain the plan in boring detail. The only important things that happen here are the dramatic beats which set up the confrontation to be the ultimate operation of the entire series. There are some moments where it feels the entire plan is on the precipice. The briefing itself is just dull though and kills the momentum going into the last section of Solid Snake's saga. The problem with the mission briefings isn't really the way they're laid out. For example, MGS1 had a somewhat similar sequence where the Colonel filled Snake in on his objectives. The difference is it was placed on the main menu. The placement is the main issue with the briefings, they're cut right into the game, so of course players are going to feel compelled to watch them in case they miss anything important. The reality is these sections practically feel like they were designed to be optional. Even once they're watched, Snake is sometimes given the gist of his goal at the beginning of the chapter anyway, making all this stuff a huge waste of time in a game that had too many cutscenes to begin with. This chapter immediately crystallizes one of the reasons why MGS4 jumps around the globe so much. It uses this as an excuse to draw from the previous games in the series. Chapter 2 resembles MGS3 quite a lot, and in Chapter 4, Snake actually goes back to Shadow Moses of MGS1. Liquid ship with its cold, blue, clinical and carefully labelled environment resembles Arsenal gear of MGS2. Even the frogs look like the Arsenal Tengu of that game. It makes for one of the most tense and enjoyable places to sneak through, but unfortunately there's only one short section of it before Snake heads indoors to the next boss fight. Johnny inexplicably turns up here even though he fell into the ocean during the launch sequence. Seems like it would have been a lot of work to fish him out of the water and then fire him back in. He could have just, you know, not fell into the ocean to save us all some time. Anyway, as much as I hate everything to do with Johnny in this game, at least this serves as a valuable clue about how to avoid Mantis's control over Snake. During the fight, Meryl gets taken control of because it happened in MGS1, and once again Snake needs to knock her out. I'm surprised they didn't also expect players to switch the controller at this point, especially since Mantis even says she can read Snake's frequency. Instead, he has to suppress his nanomachines in order to target her. Much like the vamp fight, this is very much a puzzle instead of a fully fleshed out boss. Once it becomes clear to target the puppets rather than Mantis herself, this fight is pretty much over. It's disappointingly simple, especially considering it's the last member of the B&B core and the penultimate boss of the game. The game is in pandering mode right now, so the man himself, Psycho Mantis, even makes an appearance. I don't have much of a problem with them wanting to include him, and I'll admit I found the sequence pretty funny, but it's the circumstances under which he appears which are the real problem. Apparently, he had been controlling Screaming Mantis and by extension the entire B&B core. Psycho Mantis is effectively one of the major antagonists of MGS4. This really undermines his death scene in MGS1, where he realises, right before he dies, that he could have used his powers some other way to help people. Here he is, given a second chance in the afterlife and he's squandering it again. This could have been an interesting turn of events had he been fleshed out in MGS4 and maybe had a chance to explain why he remains an enemy to Snake, but instead he's merely thrown in here because he was a fan favourite. There are a lot of other ways Mantis could have appeared in MGS4. He could have even assisted Snake instead at some point. By throwing him in without any thought, Kojima has effectively destroyed his character in the process. Not long after the fight with Mantis, we're treated to the stupidest moment in the history of Metal Gear. Meryl and Johnny meet up again and hold off an army of frogs single-handedly while also rolling over each other and discussing their wedding plans. It's cringeworthy to watch and it trivialises the danger they're in. It also makes absolutely no sense that Johnny is able to do this. His character completely changes once he rips off the mask in Chapter 3. He's revealed to be handsome and capable, and inexplicably he never shits himself again for the rest of the game, even though it's all he's done for the entire series. It's bizarre to expect us to care about this joke character having a relationship with Meryl, and his sudden transformation is completely unbelievable. 
He's a character that should have been cut, and this is a scene that should have been cut and Kojima slapped across the face for even thinking about it. Another one of Snake's protégés turns up in a much better scene, although it feels contrived how reluctant the frogs are to act when Snake is on the ground. Instead of just shooting him, they pull out their knives and do some of the slowest walking I've ever seen, giving Raiden ample time to intervene. Again, Raiden brings out some of the only substantial dialogue from Snake when he encourages Raiden to value his life more. This all leads into the microwave corridor scene, which is the emotional climax of the game. Snake makes a huge sacrifice by going down the corridor as he melts apart. From a gameplay standpoint, this is little more than an interactive cutscene, the type of thing which often arouses scorn from people for not being truly part of the game. It's true that this is very mechanically simple, but the use of split screen here to highlight what the other characters are going through really enhances the experience, and most importantly it distracts the player a little bit from the simplicity of what they're doing. Although I dislike quick time events as much as the next person, I really like the way this game expects the player to hammer the triangle button so much near the end of this section. It lasts for an extended period of time, so pressing the button as quickly as possible for that entire duration is likely to result in the player feeling a bit worn out themselves putting them in Snake's shoes. There's a couple of little problems with the scene in the server room. First of all, it's questionable whether Snake even needed to go in there, since Otacon is the one who does all the work. You could say he needed to protect the Mark III from the Dwarf Gecko, but he doesn't end up protecting it, and they actually seem to ignore the Mark III while Otacon does his job. Maybe they didn't know what was going to be in there, but they seem to know everything else about the ship. More troublesome is the way Naomi shows up after the virus is uploaded to GW. It turns out the virus is 75% her work. Naomi is a geneticist, and considering she managed to craft a virus that can target specific people based on their DNA sequence, I imagine she's one of the best in the world. I don't know a lot about genetics, but I imagine it's a pretty difficult and specialised field. In other words, if you're the top geneticist in the world, you probably don't have many other great skills, which is fine. Not only is Naomi amazing when it comes to genes, she's also apparently a brilliant programmer, able to shut down the Patriot system. All of a sudden she's turned into the science equivalent of the boss, and it seems like quite a stretch. By the way, here's Otacon just a couple of days earlier. I'm done crying. Thank you. I don't have any more tears to shed. With the system shut down, the only thing left to do is settle the score between Snake and Liquid. The two are no longer fighting for any kind of ideals at this point, it's just time for them to see who's going to win. The series culminates in two old people beating the crap out of each other in the middle of the ocean, and it makes for a surprisingly fitting ending. The gameplay is about as simple as any of the other hand-to-hand -hand fights in the series, but it feels especially brutal this time around. One of the great things about how loosely the Metal Gear series plays with the fourth wall is it enables clever little things like the health bars here during the final boss. It cycles through the previous Metal Gear Solid installments, which really helps to drive this fight home as the ultimate conclusion to the series. The only problem I have with this is the way the MGS3 section seems to treat Solid Snake and Big Boss interchangeably, turning the health bar to Naked Snake. The same is true of some of the flashbacks which show things Solid Snake would never have seen. It feels a little bit unfair to both characters to treat them this way. The use of the music is equally as brilliant as the health bars, it also recalls the past games by playing some of the more iconic tunes. The old snake theme is a particularly great piece which drives home the ending to the fight perfectly. It's not over yet. I would be hard pressed to think of any fight in a game which is so simple from a gameplay standpoint but so satisfying regardless. It's a fantastic capstone to the series. It's unclear how much this is liquid and how much it's Ocelot at this point, but if you ask me it seems to be more Ocelot. Particularly because his death scene recalls his personality from MGS3. This fight is his last chance to prove himself to Snake and by extension Big Boss. I don't know whether to pity him because he's Ocelot or hate him because he's liquid, and I suppose that might be part of the point. It's that sense theme again. Ocelot has been the only character seemingly allied with the villains across the entire series, so it was a long time coming for him to take the spotlight. I get the impression that Kojima vaguely regrets killing off Liquid at the end of MGS1, and as a result Liquid usurps Ocelot's body. Ocelot gets a nice callback to his days during the Snake Eater mission at the end, but this focus on Liquid feels as though it robs Ocelot of a proper conclusion to his story. 
without providing a proper resolution for Liquid either. The final blow to Liquid is the last thing the player does in MGS4, but there's still an hour to go before the end credits roll. A lot of this is taken up by the wedding scene, where Meryl formally becomes Mrs. Poop. It is nice to see an unambiguously happy moment presented in MGS4 for a change, but the wedding scene seems a little bit out of place. It's a bit too sugary for the end of such a bitter series. Drebin has a talk with Ocelot during this about how he was able to launder guns, just to clear up any loose ends. The Patriots AI ordered him to assist Snake because they thought doing so would stop them from being taken offline by Liquid. They could have easily just assisted Snake using the system though. In other words, Streben has no valuable function as a character. Raiden reconciles with his family and swears off fighting to live a normal life. This mirrors Snake at the end of MGS1, a hopeful future for one of the most tortured characters in the Metal Gear saga. And just like Snake from MGS1, we'll eventually find out that this doesn't stick. Finally, it all returns to that moment from the start screen, where Snake prepares to kill himself in the graveyard. Otacon puts it best when he explains it to Sonny. Snake had a hard life, and it's time to let him rest. So that ends MGS4. The theme of the entire series up to this point has been identity, and it's interesting that MGS4 feels like it lacks an identity of its own. It takes the gameplay of MGS3 and utilises it well for the first two chapters, but when it comes to boss fights they devolve into a first person shooter affair a little too often. The setting and gameplay of the later chapters is also erratic, as though the game doesn't know what it wants to be sometimes. Unlike MGS3 which seemed more focused on gameplay than ever, MGS4 continues with an increased emphasis on cutscenes, which break everything up to an extremely unhealthy degree. As with all the other titles though, there is a great game lurking below the surface, it's just more obfuscated and chopped up than ever before. If MGS4 lacks anything as a game, it's focus. It never stays fixated on one thing long enough, and its distractions like the shooting scenes aren't good enough to make up for this shortcoming. In the end, hang on, Big Boss wasn't in this game, was he? Yes, Snake and Big Boss are both revealed to be alive here at the end. I can't decide whether it was stupid or genius to reveal the return of Big Boss using the credits, but it gets the job done. He turns up to wrap up all the loose ends in a surprise 20 minute epilogue where he reconciles with Snake in the most manly way possible, a CQC hug. Metal Gear Solid games have become known for their late game twists, so I suppose it was to be expected that something like this would happen at the last minute. In that sense it's a good decision because it's surprising, but it doesn't undo the finality of all the other events. On the other hand, it feels like it paradoxically takes a lot of the wind out of the sails of the ending, perhaps because it's so lengthy in and of itself. Big Boss discusses the origin of the Patriots and has a weird little speech where he talks about numbers. He ends up killing Zero and really this underscores one of the biggest problems with the plot of MGS4 and how that plot changes the way the series is viewed. Kojima seems to have become so attached to all of his characters that he forgot to turn one of them into an antagonist. Big Boss is sympathetic, Ocelot is sympathetic, even Zero is easy to pity, given he simply wanted to carry on the boss's will, and he's a vegetable by the time the events of MGS4 take place. To be fair, this is somewhat realistic, since in the real world people always have motivations for the things they do, but it makes for a confusing and somewhat unsatisfying end to the series. The plot of MGS4 could also have been made a lot more clear had they not elected to use the term the Patriots all the time when it's not really applicable. The Patriots don't really exist anymore, and if there's anything resembling a primary antagonist in MGS4, it's simply the AI that Zero created which has now run amok. None of the characters even interact with this AI in MGS4, our only glimpse at it being in MGS2. If the AI had been established as its own character, and the dialogue had been more open about this AI being the threat, then the ending would have felt a lot more complete once it was shut down. It worked in MGS2, and it could have worked here as well. Big Boss kills Zero, thereby ensuring the Patriots are gone for good, and then the focus shifts to his own impending death. Since the boss kicked off the events of the entire series, it makes some sense to end it here at her grave. But really, I feel like this is all just set up to milk the saluting scene from MGS3 for all it's worth. The series will probably never have another moment as powerful as that scene in MGS3, but there's no sense just repeating it and expecting people to be pulled in a second time. It should have stood as its own moment, and frankly I think the part where Snake picks up Big Boss's cigar and gives it back to him is far more emotional than the salute in MGS4 because it feels like its own thing. Of all the pieces of fan service in MGS4, the salute annoys me by far the most, it's like treading on a grave. 
Personally, I like when a story ends on a grim note, but with all the stuff Snake has gone through over the years, I think it's fitting that he at least finally get to live some of his own life after the events of MGS4. Here's hoping that this time it sticks. So that, finally, concludes MGS4. As I said, it's a game lacking an identity somewhat, which could have done with a great deal more focus. I understand where Kojima was coming from though. He wanted to end with a bang, so he tried to cover everything that could possibly be brought back up in the series. Ultimately, I think he crammed too much in when the story of Old Snake coming to the end of his life would have been compelling by itself, and the times when this comes into focus are some of the most interesting parts of the narrative in MGS4. There was a lot of potential here to craft the greatest entry in the series, but the disjointed nature of it all gets in the way. The dialogue is also clunkier than ever, and the cutscene abuse is outright insane. This was never a game meant to appease people who didn't enjoy the previous entries in the series though, it was designed to please the fans. That in itself is a peculiar thing for a series which created an entire game dedicated to messing with fan expectations. Not to mention MGS3 which ignored the plot of the series in favour of a spy story set amongst the Cold War. In a way it seems like Kojima finally caved in with MGS4, giving in to every kind of desire the fans could want. As a result there are times when it feels quite hollow, as though it doesn't have the same kind of love that was poured into the other entries of the series. Maybe if some people hadn't saw fit to send a man death threats for leaving MGS2 open-ended, we might have got a better game in place of MGS4. As it stands, we got a great, if somewhat messy, tribute to the series instead of a new entry in the series. With Metal Gear Solid 4 concluded, Solid Snake, Kojima and the entire Metal Gear series itself could finally come to a rest. In the next video, I'll be looking at Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, so I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for watching.